All right, Christina. Um, anytime, I'll just give you a short introduction for the people because we have some not RWJ students here on the call, a part of the program. So for uh, anyone who does not know, Christina is one of our M4s who just graduated. She matched at Columbia. She's been a big help for a lot of our OSIG events all throughout, all throughout the year. Um, obviously, I've only been here for this past year, but she's been a superstar in terms of helping us out and being a mentor to us and helping out in any way she can. She's had a very busy year, um, but she's um, probably the best person um, maybe in the country to give this talk just because she's been very good at networking across her different conferences and people she knows and and um, and just meeting different people from different institutions, not just at Rutgers, but you know Columbia, NYU, you know, probably HSS across the, the country. So I thought that this would be a great uh, introduction just to learn more, just get, to get some sort of tidbits or advice from her. Um, and without further ado, uh, go ahead. Thank you. That was a really nice introduction. That was great. <laughs> um, so basically, yeah, that kind of encompasses it uh, a little more about me from kind of a macro perspective. I'm from New Jersey. I did my undergrad at Hopkins in neuroscience and was pre-med down there, uh, but then became interested in uh, nutrition and fitness. I was doing bodybuilding and decided that I wanted to be more in the preventative side of medicine. So I actually, it's I pursued a three-year master's at a teacher's college at Columbia, which is a program for training to become a sports dietitian um, or a, you know, any sort of dietitian really, but my focus was in sports dietetics. And then while doing that, I realized that I really missed like the medical side of things and orthopedics brought me back to apply to medical school because it really is a form of preventative medicine in my mindset because you're getting people back to moving. Uh, and what I just gave you guys is my elevator pitch. Basically, I went every interview, like they ask, what what's like your story? And I think that's number one in networking is you want to have your like concise two sentence story about, you know, a little bit about you um, and, and some of the facts, but you know, what makes you different? Um, me pursuing nutrition is different than most people. And then why orthopedics? So always bring it back to that. I think it's really important to have that ready and practice it as much as you can. And at first you're going to, it's going to sound really light B and you're going to be like, oh my God, I don't know like how to put all the important stuff in, but like, what do you want this person to remember about you? And I think what makes you unique, you could say, oh, I went to Hopkins. I was neuroscience. I did research there, but like, that's, there's a lot of neuroscience Hopkins grads that are in medical school and they're all doctors now. Um, so like try and get to the point, but talk a little bit about your path. Um, so that's like number one, I would say for networking. Um, and then I have a few slides so that we can just have something to, to, to let me see if I can do slideshow and share. Um, sure. But if at any point anyone has um, questions that, let me see. Um, you want to ask, feel free to interrupt. Like this should be, um, no, if I do, I usually have two monitors. So I'm like struggling with the one here. Can you guys see that? Yep. Oh, wow. We don't need closed captions. Okay. So, so networking and orthopedics, um, as was said, I matched at Columbia. Um, I would wanted to stay in the cities so over anyone has questions about New York City programs. I primarily applied East Coast. Um, so background a little bit more is my husband works in New York City. Uh, my family's in um, New Jersey. So geographics was really important to me. Um, but there's multiple things about this program in particular versus other ones. So when you get a little further along and you have program specific questions, please feel free to reach out. The stage you guys are at now should just be about like immersing yourself in the field of orthopedics, which you're clearly doing, um, doing summer immersion program, but um, just getting to know people because you never know. And this happened a lot for me when someone will pop up again, um, because they really like people have been huge advocates that I wouldn't have expected to like come to bat for me um, just because we worked on a project together or we made a personal connection about something. So you never know when you're going to run into someone that, you know, you might see again. So where do you start? Where you are right now is get to know your home program. I think that's really important because this is where you're going to be at for four years. Um, you will do your first sub I there and you will probably do a rotation in your third year as well. And this is where you will make mistakes and where you will learn the most. So these are the people who you really want to have a good foundational relationship with because you want them to then advocate for you when you're applying for residency. These are, you're going to get a letter from your program chair, no matter what, 
Um, and then you're also going to probably get a letter from someone that you worked with closely throughout, you know, at least your sub I, but if not throughout longitudinally throughout the four years. So building off of that, I talked to older medical students and said, who's good to like get involved with? Um, and that's how I found the people that I ended up shadowing and then eventually writing letters for me. I think it's helpful if you're able to do research with someone that's not always possible. Someone who's a great clinical mentor might not do any research and vice versa. Um, but you're, if you're able to do at least one project with someone that you're working with clinically, that really helps because then you can get a strong letter of recommendation. And then this person also knows you on multiple levels. So they not only know how good you are, you know, at completing a project and doing research, but they also know that you're good in the OR and you can work with people and you, you always show up, right? So these are things that they can then not only write about you in a letter of recommendation, but if you say, hey, I really want to go to UPenn and this person is like, well, I know the other hand attending there, we, we did residency together. They can actually talk about you genuinely and not just say, well, they're a good student. You should you know, pay attention to them. So I think if you develop these connections that are a little more meaningful than just you know on paper look good, uh, it really helps people advocate for you, which I feel like I'm I'm like repeating myself already a lot, but that's really important that you want people to be invested in you as a person and not just as, you know, this this great applicant on paper, because there's a ton of those. And at the end of the day, when you get your right, you know, that being a star applicant is like getting the ticket for the interview, but then you actually have to be someone that they want to talk to at the interview and who you are as a person is the most important thing. Um, And then Getting involved with research, that can be helpful because you can then make connections outside of your institution. So that's personally what I did for most of my research. I did some research at my home institution at Robert Wood, but then I, it was a little unique because I was also COVID era. So I reached out to NJMS and then I ended up doing research through some professional societies I was in, which I'll talk about, but I ended up getting a few mentors through that. And funny enough, like the way I got my NJMS research mentor is because they were looking for people to do mock Zoom interviews with. Um, and I, all I had to do was like sign on to Zoom and make sure the breakout rooms were happening. But that like got me in touch with an attending. So like just if you see random opportunities for things, like take advantage of them. Like it's not that was literally no skin off my back. And they were like, why is a medical student here? But then I talked to a bunch of people because of it. So it ended up paying off. Um so, and we'll talk more about like seizing opportunities, but I think in the position you're in, sometimes it could feel like, what do you have to offer as an M1 um, or now M2? Um, you're at that that cusp now, um, but you do have a lot to offer. You have a lot of free time. That's huge because residents don't have that. So there's a lot that you can contribute to research projects. Um, if you're having difficulty finding research projects, I think now these like next three bullet points can help you with this and how I got some of my additional projects that I ended up, the projects that I published that I was first author on were all through social media conferences and professional organizations. So social media, my tip for that is that you don't need to like have this prolific social media account. What it's useful for is creating a, I one, I recommend creating a professional account. So something that you have a headshot on and just like your basic descriptors, but so you can follow a bunch of professionals, societies, and residency programs and see what they're up to. So I have a separate account that I, I'm not really active on in posting, but then I'm able to see when I was able to see when residency programs had open houses. And I was able to see when people were tweeting about conferences or if people that I was like, these are research superstars, um, what when they would like post when they publish. So for example, Dr. Mulcahy is someone that is a mentor to me and she's was RJOS president and she's really active in um, sports medicine research for female athletes. And I was following her on Twitter and I was seeing she was posting a lot about social media. So then I ultimately ended up uh, doing a social media project with her, which was really exciting. Um, and so it, this just helps you, I think, stay a little more in the know because you want to have a pulse on like what's going on, what's relevant research, what's getting published. And that's really hard to do as a student. But if you're just like, you're going to scroll through Instagram anyways, when you're, when you have downtime, if you're scrolling through and that's the, the primary like feed that you have, it's going to then become more natural to ask questions and, and say, hmm, maybe I should reach out to this person and get to know who's really active and who does research with students um, who are not typically from their own institution. 
Um, you can, obviously you should put, like I post like my accomplishments or I'll post like when something is published, but you don't need to be like replying to everyone and like giving your two cents about things. I think there's a very fine line as a student that you want to like maintain professionalism, but also use it as a great tool. Um, conferences. I didn't present at a conference until this past year. So you don't, but I've attended conferences I was not presenting at. So I think I would look for meeting scholarships, um, RJOS and dimensions, MSOS all have meeting scholarships for AAOS. And then there's smaller conferences like locally that you can go to. Um, but this is a great way to network with people. It can be very overwhelming because there's a lot of people at conferences. But what makes conferences a great place to network at is that you can go to a presentation and then you actually have something to talk about with someone. So for example, at last year's AAOS, so when I was an MS3, I went to a presentation on pregnancy and orthopedics. And I knew one of the presenters just off of, she was an R, R, uh, excuse me, RWJ alum. Um, and so I didn't even have time to go up to talk to her after the presentation, but I emailed her a question I had, and she ended up then linking me with all the other presenters and we made a research project out of it. So just by being present and, um, attending this talk that I found interesting, um, I was able to then, you know, have an intelligent question instead of just, I think what's difficult is that you'll hear from residents like, oh, if you want to do research, have a research question. And you're like, I don't like I don't I can't think of just a research question off the top of my head. Um, and and you shouldn't be able to. You aren't like immersed in the field totally. But if you go to talks um, at conferences or I should say much easier and more accessible is webinars. Attend as many webinars as you can. Um, and that's what I would use social media for a lot is like Twitter. They post like, oh, come to our webinar, whatever, register for this. And like, you know, women in orthopedics or just like students in orthopedics. And then you can see like what people are talking about, even if there's a, a specialty specific. So, you know, update on shoulder practices in X, Y, Z or like the aging population. And then you might find someone and you might have a question that's actually useful and all you and you can usually get their email at the end you know, email them, ask them the question. And if they're like, this hasn't been looked into, you know, you can offer looking into it and, and move from there. Um, because I found it really difficult to come up with a unique research question on my own. And if I thought of one, it would have already been answered or wasn't a realistic research project. Um, so I think that's a good way to start. And then you should join all these professional organizations that have conferences of their own. Uh, most of the memberships are free, if not for discounted. Um, so I was a part of at your, at this point, they didn't have the medical student membership for AOS, but they have it now. And there's a ton of resources on it. Um, RJOS is great. Uh, MSOS, you can join as like a mentee and get a mentor through that. At the point you're in now, they just opened applications today. So that's a little plug for that program. Um, and then there's all these other, like more specific diversity related, um, such as Gladys Society and Dimensions, there's Pride Ortho, there's a ton of different societies that you could join based on your interest. I don't think it's necessary to go and join subspecialty societies as a medical student, because I think you want to maintain more of a general um, approach to things. And there's more resources for students in these broader societies. Um, but definitely like, you know, worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to get emails about events and it's nothing like there's no skin off your back. There's no, no one's like monitoring what the members are doing. So I find that really helpful. And like I said, attending a lot of webinars has been helpful in me in networking. All right, so tips. Um, you want to be present. So like everyone that has their cameras on is doing a great job. I was um, on a Zoom call once for a RJOS project and I ended up, this is like long story short, but um, Dr. Russo, who was past president of RJOS, like called me out on the, in a good way, not bad way. I had my camera on, um, on the uh, Zoom call. And she ended up then advocating for me to get a sub at Columbia. And like now I've matched there, right? So I think like just showing up and being present and being active, you don't have to have the most insightful question in the room. It's helpful if you do. Um, but people notice when people show up. Um, Dr. McPartley, and when I just, uh, we had like an ortho, graduation um, celebration. And he brought up how like, I was one of the first people he met because I was in clinic. And I just like signed up for clinic as an M1 that it did, the clinic doesn't exist anymore, but it used to be at the hospital for peds ortho. 
And like, I knew nothing, but I, I just showed up. And I remember being like afraid, like I was like, should I study? Are they going to ask me questions? But at the point you're at, no one really asks questions with the intention of like testing your knowledge. It's all to make sure you're learning and you're understanding. Um, you really only have to worry about testing your knowledge when you're in your sub eyes, because that's when you should at this point have been studying a lot. Not to say you shouldn't prepare for all the stuff you're doing this summer and 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 really know the anatomy, but you're at the point where it's about you learning. Um, and so just showing up and being present and asking questions is the bare minimum you can do and what you should be doing because people notice who shows up a lot. Um, I've had like many attendings that like look to look at the Zoom call attendance list, like when we're when we have conferences and stuff. So people notice and people notice when you're interactive. Um, you want to be proactive. So don't be passive. So when you are showing up, like don't be a fly in the wall, ask questions when you're at ev events and then interest in introduce yourself to someone new. Oh my God, that's such a bad typo. That's someone like new, um, <laughs> but also <laughs> someone you knew, um, use people you know as that buffer. So when, I think this applies more to conferences um, when I was in big groups, like I would try and find someone I like an attending I know, and then use them as like an, a liaison to talk to someone else. So I think one big red flag I would see constantly at conferences is students going up to attendings because they're big, big names in the field. And then they just introduce themselves and then they have nothing else to say. So it's helpful if you have, even if you have a friend with you, like I had one friend who I actually ended up matching with and we would like be like, okay, we need to tag team, like talk to this person. Um, and so make sure that like you are trying to introduce yourself in a meaningful way um, and not just like, you know, giving your elevator pitch and then walking away because that will be forgotten within 10 seconds. Um, so that, that kind of goes to like making, like being on Twitter or, or attending webinars and knowing about this person before you're going to speak to them in person or email them. And I think at the stage you guys are at, you might be sending a lot more emails than meeting people in person. And so you want to make sure your email isn't just, hi, you know, I'm a medical student. I'm interested in your work. Can we set up a time to meet? You might get some hits with that, but unless you go with a specific, you know, question that the attending can be like, oh, you know, that's an interesting project. Let's work on that. Or, oh, I have a question regarding your program and how students rotate there or so and so forth. Um, you need to give a person who you want to be your mentor, you want to network with a reason to talk to you. Most people are willing to talk on the phone um, for at least 20 minutes, if not jump on a Zoom call with you, but you want it to be worth their time and then worth your time as well. Um, being positive just means um, don't ever throw anyone else under the bus. I've seen a lot of students um, and these are people who like were on away rotations with me and then they ended up not getting interviews that would step on other students' toes and not work with them as a team. And I think this applies to summer programs and then also applies when you're on clinical rotations in any subspecialty, um, even on your court clerkship rotations. Do not put another student down to try and make yourself look better in front of an attending because you want to work with them. Um, it really is a negative um, reflection of your character and you should always be wanting to work with people. And it sounds simple, but you may start to feel pressure that like you're being graded against others. But really, if like, I think I would get graded better sometimes when I would like stay late and help another student or like let them do their own thing and not overcrowd an OR case, like you don't want to be the third person in the room and they say, oh, well, we, you can't scrub. And you're like, well, I just want to hang around. And then you start answering questions like it doesn't look good because you're really stepping on other people's toes. And, and residency is about working with your cohort um, together and not making anyone feel like they're doing worse. Right. If you think about the whole structure of residency, you have like these extremely like I, like I know nothing as an intern as I'm going in literally next week. And then I have my senior residents. And if they didn't take the time to make sure I was doing well, it's like a poor reflection on them. It's not really doing them any better because they're the senior residents. So that's something I remind everyone because when you're like in the thick of clerkship rotations, you might feel like you just want to like shine no matter what and answer all the questions, but like know your place and try and really work with your team um, there. 
and then say yes. So again, like being nervous that you don't know something or like you don't know a skill, um, that shouldn't hold you back from taking advantage of opportunities. Um, the reward for good work is good, is more work. I have like, I should have proofread this a little bit better. The reward for good work is more work, it should say. Um, because when you do a project really well, they'll be like, okay, like I know Christina can get this done. So I'm going to actually ask her to finish this lit review for me. Um, you see people working with the same groups longitudinally throughout medical school because people do a good job and they want to continue working with them. So that's really important as well. And then this is like a little do's and don'ts. You want to be prepared with your elevator pitch, which I already spoke about, um, but don't stop after your introduction, right? Like you need to go up with a purpose. If you're going to talk with someone or if you're going to send them an email, don't just introduce yourself and then leave them hanging. Like I said, have a question. Do not interrupt someone else. I would see people in large groups, like just barge over and try and introduce themselves. Um, that's, it's just really not a good way to network. Um, what is your goal of the interaction? So definitely when you're writing emails to send to people or you're going up to talk to someone, you should really know about like, what, what do you want to get out of this? Is it a research project? Do you want to get advice about their program? Do you want to get advice about their life? Like I have one mentor who I asked about navigating um, married life and residency and, and family planning. So what it, what is the reason that you're talking to them? Because, you know, then they're more willing to then spend the time to talk to you um, if you have genuine questions versus you're just another medical student that is interested in orthopedics. Um, and then make sure you close the interaction. So this is something that now that I'm, you know, matched and, and people are reaching out to me, I've realized that people don't do frequently is that they'll text me or they'll email me and say, Hey, like, I really want to talk to you and I'm more than willing to talk to people. Um, but then they won't follow up or I'll say, Hey, how about, you know, Wednesday and they'll say, okay. And then Wednesday comes and, and like nothing. Right. Um, and as you're time gets less and less as an, a resident and an attending. If someone says, yeah, let's talk Wednesday and you say, okay, on Wednesday, send them an email or a tax and say, are you still free to talk today? Because likely it's happened to me so many times, the attending or resident has forgotten. But then when I text them in that moment, they're like, okay, give me 20 minutes. And then they're ready to talk. Um, so make sure that you follow up and then remind them what you want to talk about. That's really important. Um, when I was a student, I didn't realize like how much people blur, but now that people are calling me, everyone's getting very blurry unless they have like a good pitch and real reasons why they want to talk to me. Otherwise, it's kind of just like you can be lost in like the mix of things. And the reality is, I think, you know, there's over there was like 1700 applicants to orthopedic surgery or something crazy and there's 800 spots. Um, I don't know the exact numbers. I'm sure you can Google them. But there's a lot of people. And if you don't make meaningful connections, you won't, you know, it's it's not going to work in your favor. You can be like, I know some of the pe some people who were stellar on paper, and then it just like all fell apart at sub eyes and aways because they just weren't doing well clinically in person, but they also didn't have people to advocate for them because they didn't make those relationships. So I think it's like, you know, a lot of the advice may seem vague in general, but if you really try to reach out and network with people now, um, you really can make lasting relationships that you can either call back on when you need someone to talk to when you're in the a position to apply for residency, um, but you also then can do longitudinal work with people. Um, I had like Dr. Cott was a great advisor to me throughout the like entire time I was in medical school. Um, and he set me up with like, he didn't have research projects for me, but then when he, his, um, a, another attending he worked with who was a plastic surgeon actually had projects, he recommended me. So I think if you have people to vouch for you, it's really, really helpful. Um, and then kind of find like, you don't need to stick to whatever you think you might be interested in now, but it's helpful to be good and know a lot about it. So I think I want to do sports, but, you know, I don't, you know, I might change my mind when I'm in residency, but I was always like, oh, I would like to research sports and female athletes. 
Um, I ended up not doing a ton of research in that because it's hard to, to do like RCTs, particularly at, at Rutgers or do like prospective studies and, and things like that. But um, I still have that interest and it got me talking to people in the field and finding ways that we could do research together. Um, so I think that's important is like, know what your niche is, um, be flexible, take research or any opportunities in any field, um, any subspecialty. Um, but, you know, if you have something that's important to you, it's good because you could like read a lot about it and use it as a talking point with people. Um, and so I only had a few slides because I wanted to keep this informal Q and A, but those are kind of the tips that I have and what kind of got me through. And like I said, just putting myself out there and talking to people um, went with like a meaningful interaction and having a connection point was really helpful. And then one last thing I'll add is that make, take advantage of the alumni of your home program. Um, I called a lot of people like every year uh, and then multiple times, like when I was an M1, I spoke to this one resident at NYU and that's what I ended up doing the summer program at NYU when I was an M M1 into M2. And then I spoke to her again when I was an M3 applying to sub eyes. And then as an M4, when I was making my rank list, like she ended up being really valuable in giving me advice um, that I thought was honest because she had known me for a long period of time and wasn't just like, oh, this is why you should come to NYU. You know, obviously she was like, I think this program is the best because I'm here and, and I've had this great experience. But she also helped me kind of weigh the other places I did a ways because she also did in a way at Columbia um, and just speak about the experiences they had. And then I also had a, um, I was thinking about doing in a way at Harvard. I spoke to, we, we have an alum there who just recently graduated. And he was like, your priorities sound like someone I know at Columbia. And he actually hooked me up with someone at Columbia. And that's, I spoke to her and I was like, wow this really aligns with my personality a lot better and I ended up doing the away there. So you never know what direction talking to people can get you in. Um, but I went to those like phone calls with like two or three specific questions so that it wasn't just like them spitting out, you know, their general spiel. So I think that's helpful. I've talked a lot. Let's that was awesome. Thank you so much. Trip. That was really, really helpful. And, um, you know, one question I have for you is that I feel like, you know, a lot of us, like we meet people, um, you know, like uh, doing research for them or just like uh, maybe showering them once or twice. And then, you know, it was, it's a great interaction. And, like we have like me, we email them after saying thank you. And it was a great time. But, you know, sometimes like when, you know, if you do like a research project and then like time passes, like how do you maintain a relationship, you know, longitudinally sometimes? Like I feel like it's hard to like, I don't want to just like email them, like saying like, hey, like, you know, like, do you have anything else for me? I mean, obviously, like, if it goes well, then you keep on doing more research with them. But sometimes, like, people get busy, you know. So just how would you uh, maintain that relationship? Definitely. So I had one. So one of my mentors at uh, NJMS, I asked, I met with her informally first. She And I let her know I was interested in research. Um, and she was like, I'll, I'll keep you in the back of my mind. A year later, she had a project for me. Did a project with her, got published. That was it. But then I would email her updates, you know, hi, like, you know, now I'm entering MS3 and if you have any advice on away rotation and so that you keep like cluing them in, mentors want to hear about your successes. I'd be like, hi, you know, and now I'm part of RJOS and now I'm an MSOS and the mentorship co-chair and, you know, would you like to be a part of this program um, or would you like to come talk to our students? Like, even if they don't have additional projects for you, trying to maintain a relationship with them through getting them involved in things that you're involved in um, is helpful. If you can, you know, if they're active in, in any societies and are presenting, like definitely show up. Um, but just like how you would support a friend or how you would talk to a friend, like your mentors become colleagues to you eventually. Um, I, I spoke with one attending once and he was like, you're going to be my colleague a lot longer than you're going to be my student. So I'm going to treat you like my colleague. And I think that's important. Like obviously maintain a professional relationship and, and you have to respect the attending, but, um, you know, you are at a point where you're earning a professional degree here. So you should talk to these people, how you would talk with a friend and support them. And then they will see you often. Like I said, be present. Um, and then when an opportunity presents, they will likely come back to you, especially if you've already done a project and done a good job on it. Awesome. Yeah, I feel like 
a lot of times we kind of forget, I think like maybe like just being young, like younger in our training, like we forget to update people with how we're doing and just letting them know like where we're going. And I think that's a really good advice. So thank you for that. Definitely. I have a very like silly question, but something I find myself stumbling over a lot is um, when you're like talking with someone and then you're kind of like exiting the conversation, trying to get like contact information for future. Um, I noticed like some people like prefer email or, or like cell phone numbers. Like what, do you have any guidance on like what's like professional to like ask for? Or should we like push one way or another? Um, it's hard to say. And I know like it's, it could go either way. So I think, I think it's better to ask for their email. Um, you say, would, would you mind if I sent you an email to follow up on this or if I have any questions later on? And then if they're like, oh, I never check my email, here's my phone number, then you get their phone number. And then I like, you know, as I said, multiple times I've set up calls with attendings and I, and it, they haven't, um, I'm like, oh, it's 601. And they said they would call me when they're done with clinic or something. And I've had their numbers. I've texted them and they're like, oh, I'll give you a call right now. So hopefully in, in an ideal world, you would ask for their email. They'll give you your email. You'll set up a time for a phone call. They'll give you their phone number and then you'll have it to then follow up. Um, but if they give you their phone number, it's totally fine to text. I just send a, my text is a little more formal. I'm like, hi, it's Christina Del Preti. You know, we met at so-and-so we talked about this. Let me know when a good time to call is. Um, and so I think another point I would want to bring up is like, you want to be persistent, but not annoying. And I think it's really hard to find that line. Um, I think it's okay to like reach out to someone twice within a shorter period of time, but then if they're not getting back to you with, and then. I would wait a month or two and then and then reach out again because that gives them time to maybe they're in a really busy season of their practice or family life is going on. Um, like one time I I was reaching out to an attending and she was on maternity leave. So she was not checking her email at all. Um, and then she was like, you should have texted me because then I would have gotten back to you. So I think email is the safest bet, but it is nice to have their phone number, but I wouldn't directly ask for people's phone numbers. And then another like silly question <laughs> by by myself in um do you have a rule of thumb for like if someone if a doctor keeps like using like their first name to to call them that like I know with some of the especially the residents um and then some of the doctors like they'll just keep like they'll even say like call me whatever but then I sometimes just feel like awkward doing that do you I always like, just say um, doctor so and so residents yeah. first name totally fine um Especially like I remember like emailing like literally like, when I was in August as an MS1, like someone like Dr. So and so. And then I met them and and I was like, how did I ever call you? Like you but not by your first name. Like a resident is is definitely more your level. Um it's okay in the first time you email them if you want to say Dr. So and so, totally fine. Um, but at fellows and attendings, I would all I always say, Doctor, like thank you so much, Doctor. Even if they're signing their email like Paul, I'd be like, Thank you so much, Dr. Smith, you know. I think it's just better to maintain that. Um, and then, you know, once you're a resident, if you then call someone by their first name, that, that may be preference, but usually it just ends up being, you end up calling people by their first name because you knew them earlier in their training. Um, and then, you know, once you know them later on, it's just convention. Um, I don't know if this is, a, oh, sorry, Elise, if you, did you want to go first? Okay. Um, this might just be more of like me overthinking networking, but sometimes I get worried, especially in the beginning stages of networking, um, that it's tra not transactional is the word, but it kind of sometimes feels like I'm almost using my mentor. So I don't know, like, what's the line or like, how would you navigate um, making it more of a relationship instead of being like, I need help. And I only want your help, if that makes sense. Like, sometimes I'm just worried that um, we're coming off as like, oh, we just want to use you for your advice or use you for um, other connections to be made. I think anyone who's offering like advice and mentorship is is totally aware that it's really one-sided in the beginning. Um, so I don't think you need to particularly worry about it because there are plenty of people who don't offer to be mentors because they have absolutely no interest. Um, so if they're offering to give you advice and offering to talk to you, they're, they're likely just, you know, in, invested in education and paying it forward. And, and that's what they're passionate about. And that's what I found about most people because 
then they will like go out on a limb and you're like, I didn't even ask you to do that. And that's amazing. Um, but then also don't be afraid to ask for things because you're worried about that. It is totally fine. I mean, I, I think I underdid it and you, you probably shouldn't, but I had friends from other institutions who like, were like asking multiple attendings to reach out to their number one programs or like reach out to programs before sub I to get them connections. So I think you can always ask and if someone's like, oh, I don't feel comfortable doing that. That's totally fine. Um, but it never hurts to ask. And I think as long as you've maintained like a good relationship prior to that big ask, if you have something really, you know, important that you want them to do, then it doesn't seem like you're, you're using them. I think if you were to like email someone, meet once, and then, you know, not talk to them for a bit. And then you're like, Hey, can you talk to so-and-so program director? It's kind of like, well, where have you been? Um, versus if you have asked someone for advice frequently, it's, it's not like, you know, even though you're not giving them any advice, they know that you value what they've talked to you about. And they likely know something about your personal life at this point. Um, and so they're more willing to do that for you. So I don't think you need to worry about it being transactional in any way. Uh, if someone doesn't want to do it, they just, they just won't answer your email or <laughs> request. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. I was trying to think you talk a little bit more about Columbia's program and what you said you like specifically about their program. I'm also in the city. So curious of that trajectory you went on. Yeah. So I, to give you guys background, I did, so I did a summer program at NYU when I was an M2 and then I did my away rotations at NYU at Columbia and then at Johns Hopkins because I figured, let me get out of New York, but within close enough distance for like my husband to find work, he's in finance. Um, and, and I really liked being down there for undergrad. Um, additionally, I worked with um, my class to like make sure a lot of us weren't at the same sub eyes, which I think is really important and becoming more important. Um, I think most of, I, if, I think everyone from my class matched at their sub eyes. So it, it's really like important to choose those intentionally. So prior to that, I called people who were either alumni that had been at each program. So I called someone from NYU. I called someone from um uh, I was also thinking about going to Boston. So he led me to the person at Columbia um, and then Mount Sinai um, and a couple of other places. And um, I asked them about their programs. Uh, for me personally, I wanted to see um, a program that had good strengths in sports. Like I said, I'm interested in that. Um, and also had a really like family feel to the program. So for me, the size of like what I found during my sub eyes is that having the size of like six or seven residents was the perfect fit for me because everyone was really friendly and knew each other. Um, and it didn't feel overwhelming when I was at smaller, like at home. I mean, this is like to each their own, but like the home, our home program, I love them. But when they have like a conference and like people are on call, like it just feels like not a lot of people are there. And then NYU, when they have a conference, it feels like there's like 10 programs there. So for me, I know I also learn best when I'm in that like medium sized environment. So there's a lot of uh, reflection to do on your learning skills. Um, Columbia has a lot of didactics. There's conference every morning. There's a lot of opportunities to present. And additionally, that's also how I learn really well is by like teaching back. Um, and this is something I found out because I did a lot of tutoring during like from undergrad all the way to medical school. So I think you need to know your learning style. Some people learn really well by being thrown into a situation. So at NYU, at, like they're really, really busy at Bellevue. And that's like an amazing experience to get hands on practice very quickly, very early. Um, and so if you learn really well by being like in the moment and that's the only way that things stick with you, then you might want an environment that has a little more trauma urgency. Like that's at Hopkins, they have like a lot of trauma all the time. Um, and then ultimately like when you rotate somewhere, you like find the residents that you put, click with really well, but also the attendings that feel like they're already like really good mentors to you. So when I left, I mean, I really loved all my away rotations. I would have been happy matching at any of them, which I'm really lucky because not everyone can say that. But when I left Columbia, I was almost like, I felt like I, I had more to do. Like I, I was leaving there and I was like, I need to keep learning from this person. Um, and I really felt that there was a part of me that like 
my, my story wasn't over if, if it has cheesy as that sounds, it was just really good mentorship. I had people who were willing to like advocate for me, um, even if I didn't want to go there. So that was really important to me. Um, so I think size and geography are like the number one driving factors. And then seeing if people share the same kind of educational styles, because it's five years of you learning how to be a surgeon and you want to make sure that the way they're teaching is going to help you and not be like another barrier to you learning. Awesome. Very helpful. Thank you. My husband's also in finance, so we're stuck in New York for a while. So, Yeah. I mean, and then also what I would say is that all of us know people at the other New York City programs. So like I was also like, I asked people at Mount Sinai, HSS, Monty, like, and then I would say, I, I think I interviewed everywhere in the city. So I know people at every single program. So if you ever need a person, I would be happy to link you up. <laughs> It's just like, but because then when you have a strong geographic pre- preference, whether it be like I have a friend who is applying uh, because she has family in California, so if her geographic preference is California, and if you really indicate that to people and are, are rotating out there a lot, like that's where your interviews are going to be. Like for me, I like put in my application like, oh, like my husband works in the city, so they're like, okay, she actually wants to stay here. So I think that really that helps a lot. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Hey, Christina. Um, I had a quick question in terms of networking and meeting people at conferences. Um, I guess like similar to the elevator pitch you gave, I think a lot of mine is also like pretty professional and academic with my like gap year background and then medical school and interest now. Um, I guess I'm curious when you're networking and meeting new people, how much do you try to interject like different aspects of your personal life or personal hobbies, stuff like that? Because I think that's a, from everything I've experienced, it seems like also a good way to stand out and um, very different than most what most people talk about, but also wanting to sort of keep that level of professionalism and um, yeah, keeping that dynamic there, especially yeah, if you're I meeting think, them for like the first time at a conference. Yeah, I think if you know the person, bef- like know of the person beforehand, you kind of can, and this is why I think social media is helpful because you can see what they're interested in outside of um, medicine very easily. And I'm not saying to like creep on the person and make up a fake interest and and pretend you like their favorite sports team. But if you're like, like, for example, I did bodybuilding in college and Dr. Balika at, um, Robert Wood does bodybuilding. So like, I heard about that from residents. Like I had no idea. It's not like I saw her on social media, but there, I had brought it up to the residents. Um, cause they were like, Oh, why fitness and nutrition? And they were like, Oh, you should really talk to Dr. Balika because you know, she does bodybuilding. So I think you might get like, led into situations where someone who has similar interests outside of orthopedics. Um, that's, that's what you hope. That's kind of like an organic connection. Right. But then if you are talking to someone, um, at a conference and you have no idea about them, um, I think it's, it's very safe to lift the conversation, like lulls in a certain way you can bring up a hobby or something like for me, I think people like go back and they're like, Oh, the weather's really nice today. Like for me, I garden and, and I'll be like, Oh, like, you know, it's really great, like gardening. I don't know. I, it's sounding like very forced right now, but it, you should never force it out. I think um, it should come up kind of naturally. Um, one, okay. So one thing that I always bring up is like food. So it'll be like, oh, like, did you try any restaurants around here? Like I'm a big foodie and talk about that. So I think it's very easy to switch the conversation if it's happening organically. But if there's a lot of people surrounding this person, like this would always happen with the program directors um, at conferences it's going to be harder to do that. Um, and so that's when you just kind of have to like give your elevator pitch and then see, and then have a good specific question that they could help you with. Um, so for example, when I was doing, thinking about doing it away at Hopkins, I went to AOS the summer before, whatever, the fall before I did the, the summer of my way. And I like really want to talk to Dr. Laporte and Dr. Laporte was like swarmed every second, like she got. And then finally, I went up to her and I was like, I, I don't only want to introduce myself, but your dates don't work for the way that I want. So like, what do I do? And because of that, she was like, shoot me an email. And I spoke with her and then ended up cultivating that relationship. So um, I think there's ways to talk to people that aren't so forced, but if you have the opportunity to bring up hobbies or ask them about what they like to do outside of medicine, it's really easy to then make that kind of connection. I think also outside of conferences, when you're in the OR, like people are going to ask you about your hobbies very naturally. So you'll find people that you have something in common with, or they'll tell you who you have things in common with. Hi, 
I have a quick question. Um, so I I appreciate how you went over like how to cultivate and build that relationship, and we're actively learning how to do that. But I also heard you know some stories about like when you know you spend a certain amount of time building the relationship, but then you realize that the 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 dynamic you know it doesn't work between the student and the mentor. And like, have you encountered that personally? And how would you navigate? You know, either trying to find a better way for that relationship to develop, or you know, kind of saying like, oh, you know, probably maybe this is not going to work. And how would you like, you know, get out of it? Yeah, I think you don't want to force any sort of relationship because at the end of the day, like I said, this person, if they if they just feel like they're that's when it starts to feel transactional. Almost, if this person doesn't feel like they're invested in you or you're just not mel like melding with them really well. And this happens a lot with, we've seen it um, with paired mentors that are assigned randomly. You may just not connect really well. Um, and that's okay. You can still learn something from that person or maybe hopefully they can direct you to someone else. But ultimately, like I've still kept in touch with those mentors with updates about myself um and maybe ask like like a very generic question but I don't force that relationship I'll just say you know I'm an MS3 now and I just you know my paper I just published a few papers um and I really have appreciated your support along this journey and and that's really it it hasn't doesn't and they're usually just like that's great and then that's it you know it's just not like it's not a very fruitful relationship but you never want to burn bridges um just because you're not clicking well with someone because it usually doesn't mean they're they could be trying to be invested, but you just don't, you don't like, you know, match with them very well. Um, but it's never like, you know, you may, you may, they may be best friends with someone because they did a residency with them and they're at the program you want to go to. Right. So you never know who they know. Um, and if they are offered to be your mentor in the first place, they're probably still willing to, to help you out. Um, but definitely don't force any relationships because it just, you're putting that energy into something that, um, probably isn't going to be fruitful and you, you want to take that time to then spend with other people as well. Just a, thank you for that. And just a quick, quick follow-up question. Do you have like a set time in your calendar where you like update all of your mentors? I did. I used to. Yeah. So every three months, I think I would have like a little calendar reminder and it would be like, and this is more so, so I think M2 into M3, M2, I would have it like, it was like six months and M3 thing, like more things are happening. So it would be like three to four. And then M4 was like pretty frequently because a lot of like, I'd be like, now I'm applying or like now I'm looking at sub eyes and now I'm applying and, you know, so and so forth. I have an interview at this place. Um, you know, do you know anyone? And um, I think that's really helpful because it's really hard to just be like, oh, I'm going to haphazardly update them and you want to give them a meaningful update. So if you do it in somewhat regular intervals, um, it's just a little more, you know, you can then craft the same sort of email or like tailor to the mentor, to the, to the mentor and go from there. Thank you. Um, I had another question. I mean, especially since we're um, early in our medical school careers, um, like, did you have any mentors outside of ortho? And how did you tie those mentors um, or that network into helping your career move forward, if that makes sense? Um, like, I guess it's like if we know we want to do ortho, but then we're doing our core, our core rotations with internal med or family med, and we find people that we um, really relate to or they're like great advisors, how would you connect them to like your core I guess mission is not the right word but um just like your goal to get into ortho even though they're not in ortho no that definitely makes sense and I think I mean I have two things kind of to say about that one is that as I mentioned one of my research mentors um that I worked with longitudinally was a plastic surgeon um and so I knew he was never going to be able to write me a recommendation letter or like you know, it was actually very difficult for me to even shadow him clinically because he was at a different location, but um, I still used him for advice about just applying to a surgical subspecialty. I asked about, this is kind of plastic specific because he was hand, but just about, um, he he was at NYU for his plastics fellowship. So about some of the attendings there because they cross over. Um, but when you're in your core clerkships, I found that there were a lot of people I bonded really well with. And some people will ask, like, should I get a letter from Gen Surge? 
Um, and for orthopedics, you just want orthopedics letters. I think there's only one, one or two programs and they're not in the Northeast that ask for non-orthopedics um, letters because I didn't need any. Um, and so you can still get advice from them. Like I had some really great mentors for the six weeks I was on OB or um, when I was on family medicine, but then I just didn't update them as frequently. Um, but they were really helpful in, you know, learning surgical skills or learning, you know, for family medicine, for learning shoulder and knee exams. So I think it's really valuable to make sure that you're staying involved. And then there's nothing wrong with doing research in those fields. If you pick up a project while you're on that clerkship, I know a ton of people who presented stuff because they saw a cool case and did a case report or something like that. Um, but you don't want to then jump on a project that's going to take you a lot of time, particularly in your third year that will detract from you working on other things in orthopedics, if that's what you're interested in. Um, but I treated each rotation as like, if I was going to do this rotation for my career, because you really get to make the most out of it then. Thank you. As you're talking about um, following up with people every three months, Christina, and I was curious in terms of also what you mentioned in the last answer in terms of thinking about letters, and obviously that's still way too early for us at this stage, um, but like a lot of upperclassmen I've talked to mentioned sort of like getting letters only from people that they really had a clinical experiences with or who they worked in the OR with or did sub eyes or aways with. Um, so I was just curious if you agree with that or if not, like when you're following up with your research mentors from M1 and two year, like, were you also thinking of, you know, asking them for a letter like down the line or, or not? Um, I would echo that you only want to get letters from people you work with clinically, unless you do a research year and work like for a full year with someone um, doing a specific project with them, but likely in, in the research you're setting, you're also going to their cases. Um, so I think it's really hard. It's, because I think we have this like research is the one thing we can kind of control right now with numbers. So we have this big emphasis on research, but everyone does research when you apply to orthopedics, like they just want to see that you've done some research. It's great if you've done a lot of meaningful research, um, but it's your clinical, you know, they're hiring you because that's what they're doing for residency. It's not like it is a match, but they're hiring you for your clinical skills. And because they're, you're someone that they want to teach and they want to work with, because um, you have to realize at the end of the day, residency is do I want this person to take care of my patient? Do I want to take the risk of allowing them to learn on my patient and, and, you know, put my reputation on the line for their education? Um, so you can be really great at research, but that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't matter for, for your patients, which is, is your priority at the end of the day as an attending. Um, so I think, you know, you want research mentors because they're really helpful, but you, at the end of the day, you'll ask for a letter from people you've worked with clinically. And then I getting them from your away rotations is really important because if you want to match at a place, showing that you have support from an attending that you worked with while you were there um, is, is really meaningful. And on all of my interviews, they'd be like, you got a letter from so-and-so, like, I know him from this. And I'm like, that's great. <laughs> like, I only worked with them for a month. I'm sure you know them better <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so getting, but you worked with this person, usually you're in their OR for like at least two, if not four weeks, you learn a lot about them. So it's, it's a really, even the people who wrote me letters at places uh, that I'm not going, that I did a ways at, like, I feel like I could email them and be like, they'd be happy for me. So. Could you talk a little bit about best practices in the OR? I don't have a ton of OR shadowing experience, so maybe a little tangential to this, but would be love to get your perspective on that. Yeah, I think it's just really important to follow your resident's lead. Um, ask them like what the expectations for you in the case are um, and just just like kind of follow what they're doing because it's going to be different in every case. Um, I chose like you can ask some questions, but like don't be annoying with questions. I think it's very easy to I don't know, feel like you have to ask a question and like if, if you don't ask a question, please they're going to think you're not present, but you can ask like a question and it can really backfire and you can sound not so intelligent. So don't force anything. Um, but usually just talk debrief with the resident beforehand say, you know, where, where do you usually like the student to like stand or is there anything I'm going to do during the case or should I like, is this more of an observing, um, and just know the expectations and then pay attention because you'll probably be repeating like in the same case again, eventually, whether it's 
this summer or down the line in your career. Um, but it's going to differ attending to attending. So just be like very cognizant, um, introduce yourself to everyone. So say like, tell the scrub nets who you are, tell the anesthesia who you are. Um, and then always offer to help out with like basic tasks, such as like cleaning up, moving the patient, um, things that aren't like directly involved in the surgery. Um, because those are the tasks that keep the room running. Um, and basically, you know, things that you are competent and able to do. And then once you, they show, like you show that you're involved in helping the cases move along, they might ask you to do stuff, which is really fun. Awesome. Thank you. Um, one, other, one question I've like had, and I've gotten mixed answers from people is when you're sending that initial like networking email, maybe you like met with someone and you're following up over email um, if you like attach a CV to that, like I, I never thought of that. And then I heard a few people said like every time they would initially kind of connect with someone, they would just send their CV just so they had it. Um, do you have any advice about that? I think it doesn't hurt, but it's a lot of people don't take a look at, at your CV unless you're asking a specific question about something. So when I was asking, I, when I was at the middle of my M3 year and wondering if I should take a research year or not, um, I set my CV because I wanted them to see how many research opportunities I had, but that I also like wrote in the body of the email, like I have so-and-so published papers and so-and-so, you know, this in the works and stuff like that. So I think it doesn't hurt. And it actually is good because if I did that, because it forced me to update my CV frequently, but don't be offended when they have taken zero look at it and know nothing about you when they hop on the call for you, because it's just, it's hard for them to like meaningfully look at a CV and, you know, they don't want to judge you off of that usually at that time. But if you have a meeting to say, oh, can you help me review my CV? That's a different story. Or if you have a specific question about like, do I have enough research experience or something like that? And I have another quick question. Um, I know that especially like in New Jersey and with Robert Wood, a lot of the attendings are like private practice and the volunteer faculty. Um, like when you were kind of speaking generally about like finding mentors, it sounds like a lot of them were like in an academic setting. Did you like really target an academic setting or are there a few people that you had like who are private practice, like clinical mentors that um, like eventually wrote letters for you or something? Yeah. So I had one letter from Robert Wood, which is private practice. Um, but then my other letters were from my ways in academic settings and then my other mentors and people I did research with and and like supported me presenting at conferences were all academic setting because they're just more likely to, I think, be involved in students and, and residency programs and be connected in that uh, manner. So I definitely, I, I think at one point I reached out to someone to shadow in private practice and then I, I ended up not going anywhere and I didn't really push it because um, even the shadowing experience in private practice is so different. You'll see it when you go UCAS versus you know, the Robert Wood Hospital shadowing. It's a totally different experience. It's like quick and runs really smoothly and the patients are great and out the door and in the hospital, it's a totally different setting. Um, so you're trying to learn skills. Like it's good to see private practice, but you shouldn't just try and shadow private practice because it's just totally different. And it's not what you're going to see in residency and it's not really going to be helpful in your away rotations and sub eyes. Um, it's great right now because you could see cases, which is amazing. Um, but like when you're seeking out other opportunities, like research is going to be where residents are. And, you know, things like I attended like Perry Initiative or like MSOS events that are virtual are all held by academic institutions. So. Does anyone have any more questions? I will put my email in the chat. Um, feel free to email me with any questions at any point. And it is okay if you email me twice because I get a lot of, I've, I just lost my Rutgers email. So now I get, you know, my Starbucks rewards email and important emails to the same inbox. So <laughs> I haven't gotten my Columbia email yet, even though I start next week. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, yeah, feel free, reach out. Literally no question is a dumb question. And I can also direct you to anyone that can better answer your question than me. So um, I'm also, like I said, a big plug for a mentorship program. I'm a part of that. So that's why 
I'm plugging it, but um, the application is open today. You could find, I think, the link on their website for MSOS and um, on the social media. We usually pair every single mentee. So there's no reason you shouldn't get a mentor. And it's usually someone from a big ap academic institution, which is super helpful. Um, and then, um, or, and it's an attending or a resident. Um, and then for females, RJOS has a ton of opportunities. Um, it's where I got most of my opportunities and really connected with a lot of people from Hopkins, Columbia, NYU, HSS, like literally all over. And then um, AOS is building medical student um, resources. So like just be on the lookout, take advantage of things, show up, don't be annoying. You're going to hear that a lot. Be normal um, and ask ask like questions that, you know, you genuinely want to know the answer to, not because you feel like you need to ask a question. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Christina. Of that was, Thank you for having me. That was awesome. You, you guys also asked a lot of great questions. I feel like that was a lot of questions I heard that I didn't think of myself. So thank you guys for asking all those helpful questions. And uh, best of luck on your first your intern year, Christine. This is uh, yeah, really exciting. Best of luck, everyone, on, on your medical school career. So it goes fast. Yeah, first year was, was a whirlwind. So I can only imagine how the next three years are going to go. But um, okay, everyone else, how about you stay on the call? Dr. Cott's going to come on in the next 10 minutes. So Christina, feel free. oh, she's already gone. Um, so yeah, how about we take like a 10 minute break and I'll tell Cott to come on at 8.15. And then uh, we'll go from there. Thank you, guys. Cool. Yeah, I have a question.